give a warm welcome to our first speaker of the day on track two, Alberto, uh, who's joining us from V7. Um, and he'll be talking about designing human in the loop experiences for LLMs. And I think this is going to be a great talk to start the day off with. So without further ado, let's bring Alberto on. Go. Hello, yes. how's it going? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me, Lily. It's going great. Uh, it's very warm here in London. Um, I, you know, read, right now I'd rather be in Bosnia with the uh, with the rain and cooler weather. Hmm. But I'm excited to be here and uh, to present to you. All. Awesome! I like your background as well. I can't tell if it's like bugs or this, animals. This is the original image classification. So after Darwin, there was a craze about actually depicting. We already starting the talk, I guess. So I can eat into my time, but uh, depicting. Okay animals and creatures and plants by their their ground truth classification so it's the the original way of depicting what data should look like and if you're creative enough and you can notice that there is some very broad level of clustering this is almost like an embedding space so there you wow very very cool awesome well here are your slides and take it away we only have 10 minutes so i'm gonna go in a flash and we're only going to be able to go at the surface level on some of these problems. And uh, it's probably a, a good thing because when uh, when I was first invited um, to talk, I, I thought that by now, given the rapid progress of how LLMs are making their way into products, there will be a lot more. Am I? Yeah. Audio's coming through. Cool. Um, there will be a lot more to talk about in human in the loop interaction with an LLM. And by human in the loop, I mean specifically anything that has to do with labeling or teaching or getting information that's inside here to make its way into a model's knowledge. But actually, we've made a very slow progress in this. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about human-computer interaction principles. So we're not just going to talk about labeling, which is what V7 as a company is most known for, but also the act of people teaching these LLMs. We're going to be talking about how humans are supposed to fix data issues when LLMs make mistakes, which is quite often not, not just talking about hallucinations, but perhaps answers that are subpar. And then we're going to be touching a little bit on multimodal human in the loop approaches. So anything that spans cross modalities, not just in language, but in language plus vision. To give, uh, and, and maybe to, to summarize this all, the question that we wish to ask ourselves is, is this enough? We've seen apps be developed everywhere in which the responses of a model are a thumbs up and a thumbs down. And I think we will look back at this time and cringe at the huge untapped potential that, that we, we had in improving these systems that are sometimes deployed in production and sometimes handling really important information. And we're treating them really uh, like at the, the very beginning of the machine learning implementations with just a a thumb up or a thumb down critique. I see that the slides are coming through very late in uh, in the presentation. I hope that it's not it's not confusing for you all at home. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit about uh, of an intro to myself, I, I founded um, a company called V7. We're a training data platform, and because of that, we handle the ground truth of hundreds of AI companies, and through that, we're able to learn what exactly does good knowledge look like. Uh, to be fed into neural networks. With LLMs, this has changed significantly and continues to change because we're moving further and further away from over-supervising our data. We come from a world, in industry specifically, in which we need generally lesser amounts of data that are very well labeled into a world where we are using enormous amounts of data that are really poorly labeled. Um, and we have a, a, an interesting vantage points because within V7, we actually have enormous amounts of, of data that we use in research uh, we're talking about petabytes of training data that is also really well labeled. And does that actually matter for use in industry? The big question of, of, of um, human in the loop processes specifically within LLMs is, are LLMs necessary to solve industry problems? Do you actually need something that can write Shakespeare as well as it can tell you ice cream recipes? Or do you need something that's a bit more restricted? One other very important point when it comes to human-computer interaction is that um, we like to think of LLMs as co-pilots. Um, but in reality, so this thing that is continuously supporting your actions, continuously aware of that stream of a task. And a task in uh, the case of, for example, a flight 
is taking off somewhere and landing somewhere else. But realistically, the atomic unit of a task in most machine learning software is much shorter. And we're actually using LLMs in this very same way, just like we're treating this, um, this cute uh, Labrador over here. We're asking it to retrieve some information to us. The dog comes back, we're happy, and then we start off another task and send it back to them. So the reality was we're, we're still scratching the surface of what we should be using LLMs in production for today. And the majority of production use cases that at least we're seeing from our perspective still tend to be relatively simplistic. And uh, even within our own product, the use of LLMs tends to be still using it as a glorified zero-shot model. In the case, for example, of using it in, in computer vision, they're generally used to manipulate other models since um, as, as multimodal models, uh, large models tend to be still very unreliable. They're still generally used as a glorified command K. And this is potentially okay, but there's still a lot for us to explore within this paradigm. So in this specific case, we're saying, hey, I wanna label Bs. So pull up the B model or a model that knows the B class, run it, and then maybe do some bas very basic transformation on this data. So what we ask ourselves day in and day out uh, as product designers is how do we make an experience where this thing actually learns over time? And unfortunately, this is much harder than we initially thought. Uh, within our product, we have something called auto-label, which is effectively a large model that given a small prompt, such as segmenting out one of these airplanes, it goes off and starts to segment all the other airplanes that it sees in the picture. So truly a multimodal co-pilot that is able to understand your language instructions, such as, well, an airplane, I know that it's supposed to be a Qantas airplane only in this class, to understanding the vision side. The problem that we tend to see, at least within the, the labeling space and automating labeling beyond the point where we're at, is that most of the time, if your user, which is an expert label on the other side, cannot automate, uh, cannot, um, can be you know fully automated uh, by a, a model in this case, then probably shouldn't be labeling that piece of data. And if your user is an outer distribution person or a true expert, an engineer, a radiologist, then it's very, very hard to automate them because by design, they're always introducing an out of distribution piece of knowledge to your training set. And, uh, and so this makes the job of developing uh, human in the loop experiences quite difficult. And there's a few challenges that we've encountered by now. And the first one that we see in industry is that automation is often overrated. And most of the time, it takes quite a while for a, an end-to-end -end automation system or even a co-pilot system that uh, assists someone by making them just do QA to actually find its way into prod. Um, and with LLMs, it's even harder because we're using these things that are very impressive. They can convince us that they're very intelligent by, by their means of speech, but they're actually that not that better uh, in both NLP and in, in multimodal approaches than something that is just fine-tuned with a smaller amount of data. Um, the, the challenge with getting these into prod within, for example, computer vision is that most use cases within vision don't have any undo. They involve atoms. You can't undo the picking of an apple or the cutting of a tree if you're doing it robotically. Um, it, uh, in, in many use cases, there's no room for error. Most industry use cases have defined outcomes. And this is actually one problem for why large models are not finding its way into many industry use cases is that we actually have designed industry use cases to have very strictly defined discrete outcomes. You're buying a stock or you're selling a stock. You are pushing the accelerator or you're not pushing the accelerator. So all the reasoning and logic that can happen in that 55,000 token vocabulary of a large model kind of goes to waste when the actual problems that we're using AI for are quite simple because we have designed simple systems. So we're still in a transitionary period in, in which these can find their way. Um, and they, they also bring a, a whole new set of challenges. One of them is co-pilots versus SaaS. In reality, we already have a lot of software that fulfills a particular, um, a particular profession. For example, Bloomberg will have their own Bloomberg terminal, which is great for trading, and it already has the buttons to actually be, be pushed to complete trades. Um, as a result of that, it doesn't really need uh, an LLM-like interface in many cases. It just needs to... Um, it, to complete actions, and these actions can actually be done without using a large model, but by simply using a, a classical machine learning model or even just a regular deep learning model that is fine-tuned on bespoke data. Uh, one minute. One minute? Cool. Yeah. Yep. Cool. 
The other problem is people are terrible teachers. Most of the time, if you're giving people the ability to retrain a model, they will usually give them incorrect information or information that is just not written in the way you would normally RLHF the model. And then finally, there's a problem of information asymmetry. Most of the time, the answer is not wrong. It is just the wrong information given to the wrong person. And these are still problems that within LLMs are, I would say, largely unsolved in production systems. Um, we've seen many uh, implementations of these. Adept has famously created a way that will navigate websites and, and click around things for you. But most of the time, uh, this is not just the only way in which you would use a, um, you know, a, a piece of software to go and search for homes. It's just the way that works for now. OpenAI has uh, created a pretty simplistic in interface that still works but it is not the way you would want to get house prices out of it. And so uh, many other software has done something similar. Sana, I think, has one of the better ways of implementing uh, visual feedback with the responses of an LLM. Shout out also to Glean, an enterprise search company, for doing so. Um, so 10 minutes going really fast, but to keep it short, um, th th there's many challenges for us to implement the training of, uh, uh, of new information within LLMs. Hope you've enjoyed this talk and uh, see you all in, uh, in future talks within the, the MLOps uh, day and have a good rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alberto. And make sure to check out the chat as well. People can kind of interact and follow up with you there. Thank you. Thank you, chat. Cool. And talk to you soon. Yeah.